Four days after my first meeting with Jackie, and two days before my next scheduled one, the unthinkable happens. I lose sight of a pedestrian who is in my care. It happens as I'm making a left turn at a busy intersection. A disheveled homeless guy steps into the crosswalk moments after my rear tires cross the second white line. I know this because I watch him in my rearview mirror, much as I watch every person on foot who winds up in front of, behind, or next to my car, all of whom are logically my direct responsibilities forever. But this guy just disappears. One second he's there, the next he's gone. I never get to verify that he has safely made it to the other curb. In at least a year of meticulous pedestrian tracking, never even once before have I lost sight of a single walker. I slow my car to a crawl, check all my mirrors, but it's almost lunchtime and the sidewalks are packed. Picking this guy out of the sea of people I can see in every direction will never be possible. I loop around the block and find a parking spot. At least 10 minutes have passed though, and none of the vagrants that I spot look anything like the one I remembered. I comb the whole area for signs of a medical response team. I scour the street and sidewalk for blood or other evidence of a deadly accident. I make my way back and forth across the crosswalk, pausing for the signal each time, trying to get a sense of the timing involved in crossing the street. This is OCD, I try to tell myself. Surely I would have seen, heard, or felt something if I'd hit this guy. Bullshit, doubt counters. How can you ever be certain? I ponder the question for the next 36 hours, a good many of which I spend hounding Samantha for reassurance. My poor wife. She was so encouraged, so hopeful after my first hour with Jackie. Now here we are back at square one as I beg her to walk through all the what-if scenarios. When Sam tells me for the last time that I've got to move on, I lock myself in my room and play back my virtual tape of the incident. I see my car moving into the intersection. I see the homeless guy stepping off the curb. I see the throng of frenzied business types. I see myself looking in the rearview mirror. But then the tape ends cold. So I rewind it once again, searching in desperation for images I might have missed. Nothing. So I rewind again and again and again. Mental checking, Jackie called this whole compulsion of mine as if slapping some clinical label on it could somehow help. At Channel 2 Wednesday night, I come up with a plan. I will go through the news wires looking for items about local hit and runs. I know such a crime would garner at least a few lines of copy, therefore in the absence of any relevant stories, I can safely assume that my homeless guy simply vanished into thin air. A search of the afternoon Bay Area wires comes up empty, nothing involving unexplained accidents or plowed down pedestrians. That familiar rush of relief shoots through my body like blasts of hot air defrosting by every fear-frozen cell. But I should check the morning wires too, I decide, just to be sure. So I do, and seconds later I discover a story slug that leaves me gasping for breath. Body found. In a mad panic, I scan the nine lines of copy and learn that the unidentified body was discovered at about 8 o'clock Tuesday night at a curb not all that far from where I'd driven. The man, believed to be in his 50s, was wearing a shirt that was rolled up to his chest as if the body had been dragged. According to a quote from the coroner's office, the body showed no signs of trauma but bore what appeared to be a fresh needle mark on the arm. A map. I need a damn map. Need to reassure myself and measure how far the sighted location is from the busy intersection. Damn it, it says right here, less than a mile, several blocks according to my dog-eared Thomas guide. Given this piece of evidence in the mere nine hours separating my driving scare and the body's discovery, I know I'm in trouble. If there'd ever been any chance that my fears were simply OCD obsessions, that prospect no longer exists. I am, I am certain, a cold-blooded killer. Staring at the news copy in front of me, I notice there's a media contact number for reporters wanting more information. A listing for the local coroner's office. There you go, Doubt suggests. No, I will not stoop to this new low. I will not allow myself to call under the guise of doing a story on... Shit. I jot down the seven digits. You're... you're kidding me, right? Dr. Jacqueline purses is in stitches, all but slapping her knee and wiping tears from the corners of her eyes. <laughs> I'm sorry, she says after seeing the shock on my face. Go on, please, really, this is good. I don't know what the hell to say. I'm paying this woman more than a hundred bucks an hour, and she's laughing at me. This should tick me off big time, but instead, somehow, it seems to put me at ease. Let me just make sure I'm following this one, Jackie says. You lost a guy you were tracking in your rearview mirror. Nine hours later, a junkie shows up in a gutter three blocks away, and now you're convinced you somehow did the guy in. Well, yeah, I, I guess it all sounds so stupid when she throws it back at me like this, and now I think I get what she's doing here. 
trying to make me recognize the absurdity of what I'm telling her. You don't really believe you killed that guy. I could have, I protest, still not ready to give up. Right, and his body bounced three blocks to a curb where it landed on a hypodermic needle and then mysteriously dragged another few feet just for good measure. Uh, I don't know. Jeff, this is OCD. Jackie is laughing again, and I try to join her, but it's tears that come out and shake my whole torso. So why the hell does this all feel so real, I ask, when I can finally string together a sentence? Ah, emotional reasoning, Jackie says, and goes on to explain. My misfiring brain reacts to a nonsensical thought with a biochemical fear response generally reserved in normal people for logical scares, like a bear attack or an impending train collision. Because of this fear response is, in fact, very real, it lends a certain credibility to whatever triggers I've associated with it. In simpler terms, it feels as if something horrible has happened. Intellectually, this makes sense to me, but intellect is the bullied little brother of emotion. It counts for little in the throes of panic, and perhaps this is why I want nothing more in the world at this moment than to call the coroner's office. Thank you.